All right, we are changing what we were going to do this morning. Because we we're singing that song, uh, Because He Lives. And, you know, we've got things that are going on that we're all dealing with. And I don't know, just from what it sounded like from y'all, that, and I know how it has been from what, Wednesday night to now, it's been a very stressful week. And sometimes we just need to stop and breathe. And stop and remember that things aren't always what they seem to be. Sometimes it seems like all of our hope is gone. That we have fallen flat on our face. And we would just be happy if there was an air bubble in the water for us to grasp before we drown under all the pressure, all the weight that we're facing. And while we were singing that song, of all verses to pop up into my head, was we need to remember something very simple, very profound. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So if you have your Bibles, go to Psalms 23. We're going to look at the, these uh, verses this morning. It's only six verses. Not sure where we're going with this because my notes have us being in Mark chapter 12. And I was looking forward to that message, but I think we as individuals need to hear that while it may seem like our hope is gone. While it may seem like we are down and out and all the weight and cares of the world are piling up on us, when it seems like our family is falling apart, our home is falling apart, our life is falling apart, or there's too much stress or too much for us to continue going the way we're going, we need to just stop and realize that the Lord is our shepherd. We don't need anything else. If there was anything that we needed in our world more than anything else, it is the Lord. And the only way that we can have a life that honors Him, that glorifies Him, is if we would simply realize that He is our shepherd. We as human beings don't like to be told what to do, where to go, and how to do it. It's one of the problems we have in schools. Because you're told, do this, don't do that. I mean, you walk into any classroom, and you look on the wall, and there is a sign that has class rules. You go to a job, you may not see a sign that says rules, but when you sign that contract to work there, it, there's implied rules that you're going to be on time. You're going to do the job the best of your ability. You're not going to sabotage others. You're going to work with others. And then there's that little clause down at the bottom. And any other thing deemed by management. That could be, I need you to climb up on an 18-foot ladder and change out a light bulb in here. Or it could be as simple as, can you take out the trash today? Nobody else is there. Just like Joe, this morning when you showed up for church, you didn't know that you were going to lead us in worship. Spur of a moment thing, it happened. You did a great job on it. We're appreciative of that. But we sign up as believers to follow whatever God tells us to do. But yet we buck all the time at what He tells us to do. If a sheep comes in and he starts wandering off trying to do his own thing, the problem with sheep is they're stupid. Just like us. If one goes off and does something, here goes the rest of the sheep to follow and do the same thing. That's why you have that popular phrase that parents say all the time. Well, 
If your friends jumped off of a cliff, would you jump with them? Yeah, because it looked cool. But there's something about our nature that we're going to wander all over the place and we need someone to guide us back and keep us on the straight and narrow. And that's why we have God as our shepherd. He holds us together. And then it says that I shall not want. That's not just this one little thing. If you look in the original Hebrew that this was written and pull out all of the words, it's basically telling us that we will lack absolutely nothing. So it's not just, I don't want anything. I don't need anything either. If we follow Him and follow His Word, and we do like we were, we've seen the last couple of weeks and then uh, what we were going to see uh, today about loving God and loving each other, if we're loving God and put, giving Him our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength, then everything that we do is lining up to what He wants us to do. And if we're doing what He wants us to do, then He's keeping us protected and safe. We're in His path. And then I love verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Have you looked at the grass lately? There's not too many green pastures. We were, I don't know, oh, we were coming back from uh, the Lubbock Landmark uh, yesterday, uh, way out of, off the loop in University, and we we're coming back and we passed by Rest Haven, and you look out there at that cemetery and it's nice and green because it's well watered. If I'm looking for a place to eat, why am I going to go to a desert? If I'm really hungry and I'm craving something, I don't want a McDonald's Happy Meal when I could go just a little bit farther and have a T-bone steak from Longhorn Steakhouse that just melts and is juicy and tender. Which one would you prefer? Something that we're still not sure what that meat is or something that you know is good and will fill you up. See, God doesn't take us and guide us to a place that's not good for us. He doesn't take us to a place that isn't the best. He takes us to a place with green pastures. And not just that, but He makes us to lie down in it. And if he's lying us down, you don't have to worry about allergies. You're not going to get hay fever or anything from laying down on this. But it's so green that it's luscious. It's soft. It's like laying down on a feather bed. And you just relax. Because if you've had a week like we have had, you need some relaxation going on. Just to get away and just rest. Rest your body, rest your mind, rest your heart. Doesn't mean that you have to leave town to go do it. It can simply be just turn everything off. And just maybe sit outside in the evening and watch the sunset. We've had some beautiful sunsets. The other day I was uh, sitting out in what was it? it was on Monday. Last Monday I was sitting outside and looked out and it had rained earlier that afternoon and you had these dark storm clouds on the bottom. And then a big section of beautiful bright blue sky. And then you had the pink clouds up top from the sunset. And so you had three different layers and I couldn't help but just sit there and I ended up driving a little bit out of town just so there was no distractions and I could just sit and look at the sunset. And it reminded me that even though the storm was brewing, 
there was peace in the middle of it because I know where our home is with the sunset above. And so it put things into perspective, not knowing what kind of week was going to be ahead. And you just look and you're thinking, this is what I need just to unplug and rest. That's why he has us lay down in the green pastures. He leads us beside the still waters. Still, calm, gently flowing. If you are in a uh, pool or in a creek that has a really fast moving brook and you fall down, what's going to happen? It's going to take you away. If it's strong enough, it can sweep your feet out and you go under and you could drown. But this is still water. How easy is it for you to get a mouthful of water just by bending down on the side of the creek bed and trying to cup up water if it's moving really fast? But if it's still and gentle, you can sit there and drink all day long. See, he gives us opportunities to just be still, just to relax. Sometimes I wonder if our uh, sicknesses that we have that have kind of set us back, if some of that was not just God's way of saying, you need to rest. You're doing too much. You're going too much. Just rest. The older I get, the happier I am about hearing that word. We don't have anything to do today. <laughs> I, I've always been one that we plan out everything, let's go do this, and the older I get, I'm like, how about we just do nothing? That was what was on our agenda for today. I have one thing I want to get done today, and it's rearrange our pantry. If it happens, great. If not, I'll do it tomorrow, but that was the only thing. Let's just relax and rest today. Because we all deserve it. Yes, I look forward to those naps. Uh, yesterday was such a busy day. It started at uh, We were on the go at 8.30 in the morning. And we were busy that whole time. We had about an hour and a half. And we were over here and I stretched out in front of the baptistry on the wood. And I slept hard for an hour. And was in pain for 30 minutes afterwards from just laying on wood. But it was good to just rest and relax. And he doesn't just have us lie down in the green pastures. He doesn't just have us uh, beside the still waters. There's a reason and a purpose for it. Notice what it says. He restores my soul. It's not just simply, I want you to look at this and enjoy it. And while that's great, and we definitely should, because all of creation screams out the handiwork and the glory of God, but when you sit there and you just relax and rest, you feel more restored. That's so why it's important that we get a good night's sleep, because that is while we sleep, that your body heals itself. It regenerates itself. That's why when you're sick and all you feel like doing is sleeping, the doctors will tell you, great, that's what you need to do. That's why you don't need to overexert yourself. You don't need to push your body so much because your body needs time to rest. And trust me, this is a message for you as much as it is for me because, like I said, I like to go and do not just sit at home and do nothing, but sometimes we need to just sit and do nothing and let Him restore our mind, our souls. And because we're restored, then as it continues in verse 3, He says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. We throw that word righteousness around all the time, but it simply means right 
living with God. So when our soul is restored because we've followed Him, then He will guide us so that our pathway is right in pleasing Him. We wonder why our life seems to be falling apart, why it seems like God is not answering our prayers or God's not with us. Could it possibly be? And looking back on my life, I can see that that was definitely the case. The reason why it feels like God's not with us is because we're too busy. We outran God. God says, I want you to go here. Well, this looks better over here. You know that saying, the past, the uh, grass always looks greener on the other side? Yeah, it looks greener on the other side because the light is hitting it better. And then you get over there and you find out that wasn't green grass. That was those weeds with those big old stickers all in them. And underneath that was a whole bunch of thorn bushes. And you're stuck and you can't get out anymore. And then you're like, man, I sure wish I would have still been at home. It was greener there. The prodigal son had the same problem. He was, I want my money and let me go and live my life. And in the end, when he lost everything, his money, his friends, his hope, what did he say? Let me go home and be a servant to my father. Even his servants had it better than me looking at what the pigs are eating and wanting it. Pigs are disgusting animals. They eat anything. Throw them something that has been rotten and black and, you know, those that when it, you open up that jar that's been sitting in the refrigerator for <clears throat> who knows how long. You made the mistake of opening it to see what it is because, you know, we always reuse the same container. So that Cool Whip bowl is not Cool Whip. It's beans from Thanksgiving. And you open it up and the whole house reeks for hours. And, that's, and you could give that to a pig and that pig would gobble it up. And this guy was desperately wanting to eat that food because he had lost everything. Because he got out of God's will. When we follow the pathway that God gives us and leads us on, he leads us into the right living and gets us closer. Not so that we look good, but so that his name will be praise. He says, for His name's sake, that He will be the one who receives the glory of that God did this through them. There's not just anybody that would be willing to jump up and do what you did this morning, Joe. Well, no, no, let me stay back. And that's fine. That doesn't mean that they're wrong. But because you were faithful, God will bless that. If we do what God has asked us to do, God will bless our actions because we're not doing it for us. We're doing it so that His name will be proclaimed. And then we come to that famous verse, verse 4. The one that I think sometimes... We like to hear because it brings us comfort, but we don't stop and really camp on it. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We have seen a lot of death in the last two years through COVID. We've seen a lot of death in our families friends. Sometimes when we get really sick we feel like we're going to die. Some of us have been given a diagnosis of some uh, problem that we may have physically that it seems like if I have to change everything that I'm doing 
I might as well die. But that's not why we don't, why we go through that valley. Sometimes our valley is because of our own doing. Sometimes we go through a valley of the shadow of death because we chose the wrong path. I remember the poem by Robert Frost, uh, the two uh, paths. It says that there, he came to a fork in the road and one path was well lit and it was well worn and then he looked at the other side and it looked like hardly anybody had gone down it and it was a little bit darker because the trees had covered it over. And he said that he chose that path to walk and it made all the difference. Jesus said, straight and narrow is the gate to enter into my kingdom. But broad and wide is the way that leads to destruction. And many find it, but only few choose the straight and narrow path. But either way that we choose, God is always there with us. If we choose the wrong path, He's on that path with us trying to nudge us and pull us back the right way. You have that happen all the time with family members, with friends. Uh, you might hear something on TV, hear a song, and it's trying to point you back that you need God in your life. You need to change your direction before this gets really bad. Thursday, I got a phone call that Thursday morning that a guy that I went to school uh, to church with, 40 years old, was clinging to life because of some choices that he had made in the past that finally caught up to him. And his body was giving out. And Unfortunately, well, that was Wednesday, sorry, Wednesday morning. And then Friday, Thursday morning, he died early that morning. And then you, we went to the service yesterday morning, and you see him laying in a casket at 40 years old. The prime of his life. So much to look forward to, and it's over. And you wonder, how can I go on? And it, the older people, you love them, you miss them, but it doesn't resonate as much with you as it does someone that's your own age. Especially someone that you grew up with, that you know, that are that close in age, that I don't know when my final breath is. Am I on the right path? Thankfully, he had accepted Christ, so we know where he's at. But through all of that, it just reminds us that we go through dark times in our life. And whatever circumstance that you may be going through right now may seem like it's dark and it's death. It feels like life is just tightening in and squeezing around you and all of your life is being sucked out of you. You're being pulled in so many directions. What did that verse say? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. It doesn't matter how bad our life gets. It doesn't matter how everything falls apart around us. While we hate it to happen, we don't have to fear it. Because... God's Word tells us that He is with us. He won't leave us. That valley of the shadow of death that a shepherd would know in Israel where a lot of the shepherds uh, would be, they would take their, uh, their livestock around this edge of a cliff and it's dark. And so a lot of the predators would be stationed there waiting 
for an animal to come through so they can pounce. And the sheep are defenseless. They have no one but the shepherd. He goes and he guards and he watches. And this is where the rest of that verse comes in. For you, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The staff has a hook on the end. So if they start to go too far off or if they start going and about to fall off the cliff, they can hook the sheep and pull them back up to safety. They have a rod that they carry with them on their hip and they can pull it out and they learn as little kids they'll have games with these. To, like we play cowboys and Indians, they play uh, defenders and they would have these rods and they would throw them and they have a point on the end. So if the enemy comes to attack, they can throw it and jab the enemy away to protect. His rod and His staff bring us comfort. Because when we start going astray, He pulls us back in. As a believer, if we don't feel Him tugging at us when we start going astray, we need to make sure that we really are one of His. Because we should always feel Him tugging when we go astray. But when the enemy comes, He's there to protect us as well. He fights for us. It was that uh, song that we sang a while ago that we were on His mind when He came and gave His life for us so that we could have the ultimate protection. When He gave His life for us, He gave up everything so that we could have everything. And when we die on this earth, that's not the end of the story. When our time here is over, and all that's left is an empty shell, we just begin to live. For those who have not put Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who have not asked Him to forgive them, who have not asked Him to come to live in Him and to be their Lord, life is still a real thing for eternity, but it's of a place in hell. Torment, and suffering, weeping and gnashing of teeth, a constant burning with no relief in sight, and most importantly, away from the presence of God Himself. And when we die, there is no more opportunity. There is no more change. You die and that's the end of your opportunity. You either accepted Christ or you didn't. But for those that do put their hope and their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, who ask Him to forgive them, who ask Him to be their Lord and Savior, this is what happens. Verses 5 and 6 is the promise for a believer. You prepare a table before me in the presence of God my enemies. I've always liked that because growing up and going through school, I was always the one that was picked on. I mean, if there was somebody being picked out on, uh, on the playground or outside or whatever, nobody had to ask, well, who is it? And they already knew it was Jeremy. And so it was just a given it was me. I'd walk into the classroom, the kids would throw the books off, off the back. I'd be in band, and I played trumpet, and trombones were right behind, and I would get hit all the time in the back of the head with a trombone slide. I'd get hit with drumsticks. So it was just no big deal that I would be the one that was being picked on. So I always like this verse because in the presence of my enemies, I get to eat. It doesn't say anything about them eating. But then you sit there and you break down this verse in the Hebrew and it has an even better meaning. It's not just a table is prepared. It is a banqueting buffet table. Now as you can tell, 
I like to eat. I was talking to uh, Tim earlier about when me and a friend went to Rib Crib and we had the all-you-could-eat ribs and we ate a whole side. Between the two of us, we ate an entire pig. Each of us ate a side of a pig itself. We were so stuffed, but oh, it was so good. But you have this wonderful banqueting table that is prepared just for you. And then this is where that it gets really fun and exciting. Is it says that he causes the heads of our enemies to turn and face and watch us. So picture this. This is how I see it in my mind. Is I come walking in and I sit down at the table and there are all my enemies. And God places His hand and turns, kind of like you know how parents do when we're not paying attention. They turn our heads and hold their hand there to make sure we are not looking around. Does that and holds us. Holds our enemies so they watch us. He doesn't just do that for somebody he likes. He doesn't just do that because you have a cool name. He does that because he loves you so much that he died for you. He wants to lead you on that right pathway. He wants to restore your soul. He wants to build you up. He wants you to rest so that you can see Him and praise Him in an even bigger way because you are so special. He has a party just for you. So much so that if you remember in the Gospels, it says that when one person accepts Christ, all of heaven rejoices and throws a party. When one person accepts Christ. So when you put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus and said, Lord, save me, all of heaven through a party in your name. And then here it tells us that you're going to get to be part of a party that is just for you and your enemies are going to watch you enjoy what God gave you. Now that alone should restore us some it should encourage us to keep fighting, keep going on, keep believing, keep following God's pathway. And then it doesn't just stop there. He says that you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And I love this. In the Old Testament, when they would anoint a priest or a king, they would come in and anoint his head and it would flow down their head into their beard down their clothes if you remember we talked about it right before uh, Easter that you had a woman who came in while Jesus was sitting in Simon's house the Pharisee and he was eating and visiting with them and this lady comes in and breaks open an alabaster jar and anoints his head with the perfume and it flows down him. And it covers him. She anointed him. He anoints us. Because in 1 Peter it tells us that we are a royal priesthood. Royal ambassadors. So we are being anointed by God to share this good news that God gives us everything that we could ever need. He provides for us. And then when you come into someone's house and you're visiting and you're having a meal, they would fill up the cups for you to drink and there would be different levels if yours was about a fourth of the way full, then that was a sign to you. We're glad that you're here. Enjoy this meal, and we'll see you next time. Eat and go. If it was halfway, you're more than welcome to stay, eat, enjoy the fellowship. 
but you're not spending the night. If it's full, you're more than welcome, and I can't wait to see you in the morning because you'll be here. You can stay. But it says that it overflows, which means that he pours. And as that cup is full, it just keeps running over, signifying my house is your house. You always have a place here with me. And this isn't just somebody writing this. This isn't David writing this saying that when you come into my house, I will uh, let your cup overflow. He's talking about God here. Saying that when I'm in your house, you have my cup overflow. Meaning that God loves you so much that not only does He provide everything for you, not only does He walk with you when times get tough, not only does He protect you and guide you and lead you and restore you, not only does He uh, prepare a table for your enemies to watch, I don't ever want you to leave. I want you to always be with me. So, I'll, when life gets tough and we feel broken down, we need to remember that God always wants us with Him. He overflows that cup, and I mean, water's just gushing everywhere. It's like when our water heater over here broke that time. The whole bottom rusted off, and I, we had water everywhere. That would be like God just constantly pouring His cup out. We've seen it more and more than we can even count. When God does that with His blessings towards us, that we we think that we can't even manage to make it. All of our hope is gone. I mean, you open the refrigerator and you you got water and you got a couple of fruit that you got to cut a couple of spots out of, and you're down to last, you know, those pieces of cheese, grated cheese that gets in the corner of the bag that you can't get out. And you got a one slice of the heel on the bread and that's all you got. And then all of a sudden God does something. And now you have a refrigerator full of food. Now you have gas in your vehicle. Because God provided for you. God blessed you abundantly more than we could ever dream or imagine. And He does that on a regular basis for us. Our cup runs over because of God. And then I love this in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of of my life. You know the little puppies when you first get them and they start getting attached to you? Yeah. Or you got one of those little <clears throat> rug rats that like to follow you everywhere you go? You can't even go to the bathroom without them coming in? I crack up every time I'm at my mom's. She'll go to the bathroom and all of a sudden you hear the bathroom door pop open. She's like, well come on if you're coming. She's not saying that to me. She's not saying that to Landon. But her cats will love to go in, especially when she's taking a shower. They'll just walk in and just sit there. And everywhere she goes, they'll just follow. That's how goodness and mercy are. They follow us everywhere we go. You go left, it goes left. You go right, it goes right. You go up, it goes up. You go down, it goes down. When we're following what God wants us to do and we're living for Him, His goodness, His mercy, His love follows us all the ways. When it says, all the days of my life, all of the days of the days of our lives. Is that... Uh, 
line from days of our lives. As sands through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. As sands through the hourglass, so are the goodness and the mercy of Jesus Christ upon our lives. And then he ends it with, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Some put it that shall return to dwell in the house of the Lord. One day we will be in His house. But as we've seen the last couple of weeks, we are His temple. Our body is the temple of God, so His house should be wherever we go. Wherever we worship, wherever we work, wherever we live, wherever we go to school, is should be a place of worship because our lives should be the example that while the world is doing whatever they're doing, we live by a different set of rules. When the world says it's acceptable and okay to be whatever gender you want to be, or it's okay and acceptable and don't dare tell me that it's a life at conception. We live by a different set of rules. We live by a rule that says that we love God first and foremost. And that He is first in our life. And when He is, that's what we get. I love how the message translation puts this passage. And as we close, let me read it from it. It says, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me. Every day of my life, I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. Is your head drooping today? Are you weary, worn out, ready for a break, ready for just some rest and relaxation? How about today? We change our plans. Uh huh. Yeah. We change our plans, and all we do is just rest. If that means take a nap, take a nap. If that means lay outside and enjoy a beautiful day, lay outside and enjoy a beautiful day. Whatever it is that will bring you relaxation and rest, yeah. not just for the sake of doing it but so that our minds can be freed of whatever cares that we're going through today. So that our mind can be put back on the right path. The pathway of Jesus Christ. His word. His will. His promises to us. I guarantee you with certainty that if we'll do that today and restore ourselves in Him, Today, when we come here next Sunday, we'll have a much different week than we did this week. Now, don't think that just because we did that, you're not going to have any problems. When we get closer to God, Satan starts attacking harder. But remember, we don't have to fear the evil. Because God is with us, protecting us, guiding us, leading us. So which would you rather have? The muddy water from Buffalo 
or the cool, quiet, cleansing, enjoyable spring water that flows. I'll take the clean water any day. Because anything that this world gives us for rest and relaxation or to guide us is nothing better than buffalo water. But when we put our faith and our trust and get our guidance from God and His Word, this cool, quiet, refreshing streams. So may we find comfort and peace and hope and strength in these words today. Totally not what I thought we were doing when I got here this morning. But you know, God has a way of changing things to give us what we needed. And I'll tell you this much, just from this message right now, I feel calmer than I did when I got up here today. Not just during the service, but right before I started giving you this message that he's giving to both of us. So let today be a day of refreshing. For your heart, for your soul, for your mind. And may we go through the week knowing that He is still on the throne. And He has His arms open wide pouring this cup of blessing and refreshment for our souls today. God, we thank You that You love us so much that You will change plans and order so that we can be refreshed by You. Thank You for Your Word this morning. For You truly are our shepherd. May we find rest and comfort in that and in You and Your Word. Thank you that you restore us. And you lead and guide us. And you protect us. Thank you for your mercy and your goodness to follow us every day. And we can't wait to be in your presence, worshiping and singing, because of what you have done for us here this earth. In your name we pray. Amen.